You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. And I'm joined here by... I'm Shagun Yedele, and uh, happy to be here today. Um, and I am coming to you from Kelowna in the unceded and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nations. And we have a very special guest that I'm excited to introduce today. Creota, would you please um, say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Creota Wilberg. I'm a cartoonist, and my specialty is graphic medicine, um, healthcare, and anatomy. And I'm in New York City. Thanks for joining us, Creota. I'm sure. so thrilled to have you on this podcast with us. I came across your work a couple of years ago, and I've been assigning one of your works, The Silver Wire, to my students as reading. And um, I'm, I'm just a little bit starstruck to have you here in person on Zoom and to be talking to you about your work. Um, you come from a really interesting background. You're a teacher, um, a dancer, a massage therapist, and now a cartoonist. So you've been working with the human body and in so many different ways. Tell us about your journey. Yeah, I am. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I was a I was a dancer for about 30 years. Um, I was also a terrible waitress. And so my side job, <laughs> my day job um, became as a massage therapist. I, you know, I went back to school, I studied massage therapy, and I really discovered a love of anatomy um, when I was studying dance, but then it really became solidified um, as a massage therapist. Um, as a dancer, you're experiencing anatomy internally, but then as a massage therapist, you're taking two-dimensional images, you know, from the book of the screen onto a three-dimensional living body. So I developed like an additional way of appreciating the body. And then also, you know, as an artist, um, I, I, uh, slowly realized that, you know, most artists are looking at the human body essentially just as a superficial surface surrounding, you know, skin essentially surrounding an unknown solid mass that doesn't really, you know, make that much difference uh, to each other. But when I, when I um, was drawing with my own practice, I was all I would always draw like the skeleton of the body or the anatomy of the body first. And then I would like cover it with skin or whatever. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I've, I've just really, you know, I was a dancer for 30 odd years, a massage therapist for 30 odd years. Now um, two hip replacements later, I'm a cartoonist <laughs> doing graphic medicine and um, really it's given me the opportunity to express a lot of ideas that I've had about the body that I've, you know, also communicated to my students, my massage students, my dance students and fitness students. Um, like you were a donut. You brought that up, right? I'll show, I'll hold up the mini. You were a donut, right? It's a little mini comic that um, explains the gut, you know, and, how our insides are technically outside our body. Um, and this is a metaphor that I used that I stole from, you know, previous teachers, you know, I mean, here I am in New York, bagel was kind of the, the <laughs> metaphor, but um, I, 
I really love to play with metaphor and take things literally. So I made this comic that literally made a person a donut and then a person in order to explain, um, you know, how the gut is essentially external to our body and also internal at the same time. Um, and I feel like the traditions of teaching anatomy and actually have a lot to offer in terms of these metaphors. And, you know, they really provide me with opportunities to like create really entertaining and fun uh, visual narratives that can either serve, you know, for humor or for education or for both. So, yeah. Yeah. So. All right. That's so beautiful to hear because I frequently encounter a lot of people who you know after hearing what i do uh, i'm an anatomist they said oh what's 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 what else is there to learn about the human body you you know we know it all and i and i said but we don't and and we not only do we not as a matter of fact but there's different ways of teaching the material there's different ways of communicating the material uh, which uh, is typified by, by what you do and exemplified by a lot of the things that you do um, and and so that to me is super interesting to see that you actually find creative new ways of communicating what people take for granted until there's a problem in their right, body. <laughs> right, right. Well, and each discipline also, like we all prioritize things differently. You know, as a massage therapist, I um, remember one encounter with a patient who was actually a thoracic surgeon. And I was working on his upper back and I, you know, I felt like some taut bands of muscles, some muscle spasm, and there, there are ways you palpate so you can determine the layer and the musculature. And, you know, I said to him, oh yes. Okay. You know, you've got, you know, the muscle tension is in longissimus thoracis. And he, he just said to me, you know, he's face down on the table, but he just said to me, look, if it's not in my way to get to the heart, I don't know what it is. And I was shocked, shocked. The guy is, you know, he's a heart surgeon, like super smart, like, you know, had studied everything, like had a much bigger license than mine. And yet he didn't know the names of the muscles or the locations of the muscles on his upper back. Like at the level of his heart, it's like, if it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't a part of his job, it just wasn't there. And I just found that fascinating, you know, and again, like different people have different priorities. And so I really enjoy kind of um, also playing with those expectations as well. <laughs> that was a very formative moment for me, I think. I bet. I mean, that must be so interesting. You would expect that person to go, yes, and right next to it, we'll find, you know, exactly. and engage in a conversation. Whereas he was like, nope, it's not, it's nope. not on the chest. No, nope. he's know. like, you More know, relevant. just do what you do, get rid of the knot, you know. Yep. <laughs> so you have such a unique approach to the human body. 30 years as a dancer, you know your own body really well. Uh, two hip replacements tells me that you've had... Uh, <laughs> quite the the experience there um, with probably due to dancing and all of that yes, yes. then experiencing and really feeling other people's bodies in a very intimate way as a massage therapist I went to get um, a massage by a massage therapist a while ago and she was like so you do a lot of this type of thing I'm like yes you're very stressed. I'm like, yes. You hold a lot of responsibility. I'm like, yes. So she knew all the things about me. Yeah, it's Just by all the tension in my back. And so you're so used to experiencing and feeling other people's bodies. And now you tell stories about bodies. Um, I want to really dive into this, into your perspective on, on the human body in that way. Yeah, well, you know, also as I've been aging, again, when I was when I was first a dancer, I was just very oriented into kinesiology. Like that was my that was my big interest. And then I, as I became a massage therapist and a dancer, then palpation, different forms of orthopedic injuries, sports massage, orthopedic rehab, that became my focus. And then 
you know, over time, I would also start to become a patient myself, start to get injured, different things would happen. And my focus would start to change. Um, and uh, um, I started working around 2011 or 2012. So I started working um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as a massage therapist. So I also really became um, kind of hyper aware of the resilience of the body and its ability, like, and its ability to keep like repairing and healing itself. It would also appear to become sicker and sicker, but at the same time, it's like, oh my gosh, these bodies are still like functioning and these people are still vital. And, you know, they're, I really began to like appreciate the resilience of the body and the deceptiveness of illness, like in terms of what was happening with the body. And throughout my career, you know, I just, I would start to be obsessive with a certain aspect of the body. And then over time that would change. So, um, you know, when I did silver wire, I was, I was the artist in residence at the New York Academy of Medicine Library's historical collection. And uh, I'd also gotten a certificate in bioethics. And um, I was reading about uh, J. Marion Sims, his experimentation on enslaved women uh, for the treatment and cure of vesicovaginal fistula. And fistula. Um, this type of fistula is also like, it can be um, a side effect of like pelvic surgery and radiation for certain forms of cancer. So some of my patients had actually been experiencing that. And so I just, again, I just found these ways to make these connections in an entirely different way that I thought, you know, would make a really good argument for understanding that you know, we still, we, you know, everyone around the world owes a huge debt of gratitude and understanding to, you know, enslaved people and the sacrifices they made for the health and well being of people even today. Like, you know, and that this is really an important thing that we all begin to understand. Um, I, also, uh, I like to um, try to find ways to in, like pull people into areas of knowledge um, and make them feel not like I am lecturing to them, but they already have like a certain level of understanding, which is why I use embroidery in um, silver wire, because sewing, again, is a skill that many, many people have. Um, so I just imagined I was writing this book essentially for like another white middle-aged woman who might be on the fence about how to contextualize, you know, enslavement, what that means, and whether we could possibly still carry some like moral debt and responsibility. So I just, you know, it's like I created this person in my mind that I was writing this book for. And I was like, okay, I'm going to hook them with embroider. It's another embroiderer. Like I'm going to seduce them into my narrative. I'm going to take them into medical history and I'm going to, you know, bring it up to the present day and show how this has affected my own life. And my, you know, my experiences at Sloan Kettering um, were the things that were able to kind of cement that deal and really like give me a way to, to demonstrate to people that, you know, these are, these are issues that can't be ignored and can't be denied really. So. Well, Cleota, I have to say like the silver wire was the first work of yours that I found. And I was probably exactly your target audience. So a middle-aged white woman who likes embroidery and um, sort of 
what is often kind of put in the corner of women's arts. So any sort of fiber yeah. art and things like that. Yeah. And yeah. of course, you know, teaching anatomy and, and uh, you know, having a medical background. So I was really drawn in. I, I was moved to tears by, by your comic. I mean, it was um, so poignant and so beautifully told. Um, and like the history of these instruments, the history of the suture techniques, the history of that silver wire and um, the, you know, ex exploitation of enslaved women to gain that knowledge. And um, so thank you for, for that work. Um, well, thank it, you so yeah. much for those kind words. I'm very touched and I'm really um, great. Okay, I could retire now. <laughs> <laughs> my career would have been fulfilled I won't but I could and it would be all right because <laughs> I'm like actually I've made a mark it's great um but uh but yeah you know and and this book like it's it was a huge challenge I've never made anything quite like it I've done some other pieces since then that are also like exploring other bioethical issues um, you know, about cadavers, are they people, are they not people, and how that translates to patients, are they people, are they not people, you know, and how that works for me. But, um, but also, uh, I, you know, with Silver Wire, I was also really looking for a way to like ease people in, you know, so it's all colored in pastels, you know, my friend Molly, who is a palliative care surgeon, she, works at a hospital that's right next to the New York Academy of Medicine library. So we went to Central Park one day and she literally, we wounded fruit and she taught me how to suture it up. So I used that experience um, and our walk right by the statue of J. Marion Sims and our conversation, you know, it's like I used that experience to, as an anchor for the narrative. And, um, but I was afraid that people will, might like start to feel uncomfortable or whatever. So, you know, it's like, as you browse through, you'll see, you know, I keep putting little chipmunks in there, like little cute, like I put little cute friendly mascots, like in the visuals to kind of also try to give the person like a feeling of almost peace and tran tranquility as they're like absorbing this, um, this really tough information. Right. Um, yeah. And the toughness also, you know, again, like going back to the idea of women's work, you know, one thing that's, uh, was a joke at the, at the Academy library was, you know, embroidery is women sewing and historically speaking, surgery is man sewing, you know, there are these gendered, you know, it's sewing, but they're like gendered roles, like in these, similar tasks you know although the outcome is different the stitches are shared they're the same stitches but you know the mm -hmm. surgeons surgeons like rename those stitches after themselves <laughs> i think like the halstead stitch is the blanket stitch you know it's like um yeah. no one says that's that's a, a great segue into talking about your cartoon work and your artwork where um, you use your art and the cartoon uh, drawings to also represent the body in different, you know, in, you know, uh, and I'm wondering the, about the intersection of that and what you've been talking about, uh, how, how does that make people feel comfortable or not, you know, so like the social the the um philosophical aspects of that you know the does that change perceptions uh does it you know make people does it draw people in or what, what's the audience that tend to react or, or appreciate that kind of work um do you want to comment on that sure um one so you know when i'm when i'm with my colleagues and you know my other like anatomy and pathology teaching colleagues, you know, when we're making jokes, you know, my husband might just be sitting at the table, just kind of waiting for someone to explain <laughs> why things are so funny. And we're just like snorting and laughing hysterically, because it's all very technical, right. Um, and, 
so when I first started making comics, uh, my my jokes were too insider. And actually, Bob and I would have um, a lot of conversations about this. And then I actually started making gag cartoons for performances because he has this carousel series. And then the performance would be the explanation of why the joke was so funny. So I, I, have, I spend a lot of time thinking about how am I going to convey this information to people who don't have this, don't share my same experiences? How am I going to do it in a way that doesn't like, you know, make them feel like they're being lectured at? And um, the way that I've done it is probably not the best way for everybody, but I use humor to do it and a lot of dad jokes and like stupid humor because then the reader will be reading my book about you know anatomy cadaver dissection surgery you know whatever it is you know they'll be reading my book and um the jokes will sometimes be really dumb <laughs> and then the reader can be like oh you know silly author like you may know all about, you know, cholecystectomies, or you may know all about, you know, um, the islets of longer hands or whatever, but certainly you do not know about humor. So then we're like on, we're on a more equal footing. Like I will try to present very complex ideas with like kind of dumb poop jokes or whatever to like try to make things feel a little more even, so even the scale, the yeah. yeah that's how I teach that's why I make so many dumb jokes in my lectures <laughs> my my kids are like dad jokes are one thing but professor jokes are a whole nother level of oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah one thing though that I've discovered is um for some for some people it doesn't work like you know when you're, for example, when you're working in a cancer hospital and you are like, you know, facing, you're working with patients who are undergoing like extremely profound emotional, you know, stresses every single day when you're there, you know, it's like, it's a sense of humor has to be like very gentle and very mild in those environments. But then let's say on the weekend, you like go out to a bar and you meet with some of your friends who also work in the same environments. The jokes can sometimes get a little bit more maudlin and it's kind of a, it's a coping mechanism. Like we're all just trying to blow off some steam and like talk about the experiences we're having. And um, for me, like sometimes I try to translate those jokes into my work, but again, some people are not going to appreciate humor about topics that they take very seriously. You know, so with Silver Wire, it's like very gentle. There's a little humor, but not very much. And there's only humor like in places where the stakes are very low. Um, so that was kind of a hit and miss experience for me, like trying to figure out, you know, how I could, how I could like make jokes about like high stakes issues if I could like, and what I could do about them. Um, but boy, sometimes I really just want to let loose and, you know, <laughs> and actually, can I show, can I talk about, um, can I talk about the wandering uterus for a moment? I was going to ask you that. about this because I thought that was really fascinating because, um, you know, you, you have this comic book uterus that walks around. So tell us more about yeah. that. So I made this book because as a massage therapist, working in, you know, working with people who are gravely ill, I have encountered some people who are like, I don't want chemotherapy. I don't want surgery. I want to cure my cancer with herbs and ancient medical wisdom. And I have to respect my patient at the same time, I have to make it very clear that massage therapy will not treat cancer. It will treat symptoms of cancer and cancer treatments, but it will not get rid of the cancer. But it, you know, 
I get very frustrated also with um, integrative medicine people who insinuate that you know alternative treatments could actually be alternative treatments. So this is my this is my fantasy response to ancient medical wisdom. <laughs> so in it, I I have a migraine and. I decide to use ancient medical wisdom to treat my migraine. And the thing is, for 2000 years, literally from the time of ancient Egypt, like up through the Middle Ages, the, the medical model for women's health and medicine was the idea that the uterus of anyone with a uterus could literally move around the body. And that was, that was her problem. So if I have a migraine and I'm using like the medical the medical models of Gita Sholiak or Ptolemy, you know, in ancient Egypt or whoever in between, right? Galen, whatever. It's like my uterus has gone into my head and it's pressing on my brain and that's the problem. Or let's say I have chest pain, I'm short of breath, I've got sweats. It's not a heart attack. My uterus is pressing on my heart. So the whole, you know, ancient medical wisdom in this case is not such a great <laughs> treatment for like things that would ail me. And so I use this as my fantasy to like kind of fill out those scenarios and kind of like vent my vent my frustration about it. Um, so I turned the wandering uterus into a wandering uterus and I gave it a little personality I've really gotten into mascots. I hate mascots, but I just keep using them and I really lean into them. So this is a medieval anatomical chart where it shows the uterus like wandering into different places. And the way to keep a woman's uterus in her pelvis essentially was to make sure she was having sex and got pregnant. And then she would be better. Everything would be fine. So um, I also... I love to play with these different elements. I love to let my mind wander around things. So I used so uh, some medieval cures for um, scaring your uterus or getting your uterus back down to your pelvis would be to sniff something obnoxious, which is where smelling salts evolved from, right? So in medieval times, they would burn bed bugs and make like, a woman smell bed bugs, or they would fumigate the woman's vagina with like sweet smelling things, frankincense, whatever, to, to entice the uterus back down. So I'm going to share a little bit too much at the punchline here. So I'm using, I'm doing the um, 21st century equivalent of that. So I'm sniffing fingernail polish remover, and I'm fumigating myself with a pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> and so the element of play for me and gives me a way of like venting my frustrations in a comedic and humorous way that hopefully will not be offensive to anyone like I'm not pointing the finger at anybody and saying you're doing this it's like I'm doing this which is also true for silver wire and silver wire. I say, I want to deny that these things are happening, but I cannot. And this is why. So again, for communicating uncomfortable information, I also, I use myself as the foil. Like I'm being, I'm thinking the way I shouldn't be thinking, but I'm going to work through it or I'm doing something really stupid. Like fumigating my crotch with a pumpkin spice latte to try and get my uterus back into my pelvis. You know, so I make myself the butt of the joke or, you know, whatever. And I also feel like that's a way to keep, like, to keep people from feeling like they're lectured and being told what they shouldn't do, because I'm just reflecting, you know, what I see as, you know, a behavior that might not be such a good idea. And I use myself to demonstrate it. Um, but right. yeah. it's, it's. It's provocative um, and at the same time, hopefully comedic, you know, to enough to make people laugh and then take a second <laughs> look at themselves and then, you know, consider 
these other beliefs that they have and and wonder whether there's any validity yeah. to them and <laughs> yeah so i think i think it's comedic genius i think it's really oh, thank you i think it's really good yeah, it's it's definitely a performative element. I think, you know, my years as a dancer and a choreographer really like made that a part of my, you know, of the work I put into my comics. You know? Oh my gosh, I just misunderstood that that as my uterus as a dancer and as a choreographer. No, like, oh, so <laughs> no my years as a dancer and a choreographer. I mean, my uterus was there for sure, but um was the uterus like, dancing? That's the question. And or was the uterus the choreographer? <laughs> um, some people might argue that. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> but, so um, obviously, but yeah. your work has, I mean, in my view, has uh, reached a very broad audience and and uh, has achieved acclaim, and um, and I, and I'm. You know, and our students uh, through Claudia uh, and all some of the other courses that she teaches have um, have been exposed to to this work. And, and I'm I'm thinking in terms of um, the more academic setting, what you would uh, like it's our students and uh, in terms of teaching, whether you would think representation of the body in these kinds of ways uh, can achieve some. Um, to what to what use can we make some of the things that you do? How how can we use your work, for right, example, right. Uh, well, to, to teach more traditional students? Right. So again, like I said, elements of play I think are very important, um, and I use humor a lot in my own classes when I'm when I'm teaching about the body. Right now, I'm the artist in residence in the Master Scholars Program of Humanistic Medicine at NYU Langone. Grossman School of Medicine. So I'm teaching drawing classes to medical students and hospital staff. Um, and I, um, I feel like, again, like elements of play can be very useful, even though you're trying, you're like working with more uh, intense bioethical issues. Um, but I'm in this, I'm actually, I don't know if I'm answering your question because I'm kind of like talking about my own unique situation, but I'm looking at, um, what I end up doing is looking at like different transitional moments within my own life and uh, examining like my rationale for like how I've, adapted to different ideas or changed my mind about certain ideas. And then I bring those ideas up to my students or like I'll bring them up as a theme and I'll um, kind of shove it at this in my class. And it's like, okay, everybody, let's, let's talk about this. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I agree. And I, and I think that's absolutely valid because that's what we, we, I'm I'm thinking of what we teach our students how that that they should consider the so for example we say you don't treat the you don't treat the disease you treat the patient you treat the right. person right. so in, in other words you, you you try and see your patient in a as a human first and foremost you know and listen to them as a human and not just ticking off a checklist of symptoms that you're trying to do. So in other words, presenting the body, presenting anatomy with a uniquely personal perspective is a very valid thing to do. And then it, it probably would stimulate the students to also think themselves uh, in terms of, in, in such, in similar terms. And definitely our body banter podcasts do a lot of that. You know, we, we bring in perspectives from very wide variety of individuals from different walks of life to tell the story of the human body from their perspective, which is what you're doing today. And, and, and I so much appreciate this. Yeah. Well, and you know, the, the, is, is the body a person or a body part, you know, has also been a part of my own practice. You know, it's like, I have a, I have a book out called cadaver diaries because I'm teaching drawing in a cadaver lab. 
And through my own teaching and observing my students who were drawing cadavers, I was also, again, thinking about my own experiences. And sometimes, you know, at a certain point, I, I, was, I felt like I had been groomed to think, oh, the patient must always be a person. But actually, sometimes at my, I'm at my best therapeutically if I'm able to communicate to my patient as a person and a human being, but then when I am, when I have my hands on their radiation fibrosis at their surgical site, where there's, where I'm trying to figure out like what the surgeon, after I've read the OR report, I'm trying to figure out like what the surgeon has left and what the surgeon has taken out. Like the patient kind of has to turn into to be totally crude, a piece of anatomical meat, because I have got to like figure out what's going on there. And if I spend too much time realizing what this delightful person has experienced, it's going to like cloud my judgment. So I, I realized I have to be able to turn it on and off or work it simultaneously, which took me years to get to. But that revelation, like, you know, when I was in practice, like really came in handy for me and my students now at NYU, like when we go to draw, you know, and they're being artists. So the pressure is kind of off, you know, I mean, everyone's still feeling pressured to be perfect with everything. But, you know, when we go back to look at the bodies for the first time, and some people have never seen a cadaver, you know, I say, do you want to see this person's face? Um, Because with my first experiences with cadavers, the professor would not uncover the face. It's not a person, it's a body. And that's, you know, how they, how they rationalize things and protected us, I'm thinking emotionally. But when I ask people if they would like to see the face and see the person now, they're a little bit more, I think they're braver. And since they have the option, they will say yes you know, usually, sometimes they will say no, but, but I'm like, okay, we're going to look at this person's face and then we're going to draw their colon. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, you know, it's like, this is a human being who has donated their body to science. We're going to be really grateful, acknowledge them as a person. And now we're going to draw their guts, you know, and um, um, I, you know, and I don't talk this way around my student. <laughs> like, I'll, like I'll use teacher talk. Like I'll be professional. Here, yeah. here we're being casual, and we're not inside the lab, so I feel like I can be a little more humorous. But um, absolutely, but, you know. and I think what you've really put your finger on is this um, this shift. And I think, like in uh, social sciences, that's often called code switching, right? When you kind of do one thing and then the other that you can have both at the same time and yes. remember the donor's humanity the patient's humanity yes and have that very narrow focus on the anatomy and what you're trying to learn and and that you switch between the two and it's true like from my own experience um I've been an anatomist for more years than I care to admit to and every year I still get a little bit emotional when we go into the lab the first time Every yeah. year, I I, yeah. I think it's also I feel what the students are feeling, and you know, and then this sense of awe, and and just this immense sense of gratitude. You yeah. walk into the lab, and at the end of August, and these all of these donors from our community who you know, it, it's like oh, that's it's, it's a it's a moment of awe, and I'm grateful I still feel that after. Yeah, all these they've years. changed our lives again and again and again. Absolutely. And then I focus in and I'm like, we're going to go right in and we're going to start and look at these muscles. And, and so it's true. It's that switch. And I, I really appreciate how you just formulated my experience in such an eloquent way, like that we, we switch between the two. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, Shagan, do you, do you feel the same when you like that switch happening uh, in your experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that we do without thinking about it <laughs> you know it's almost subconscious where mm-hmm. you 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 like you described get into the lab and our students are exactly the same creota we do not uncover the face until much 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 later mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. until the students get a feel and then they've worked on the body 
And after a while, the body actually means something to them. Yes. Um, then they've, they've now developed a relationship with that body and, and are then ready to have a look at the face in second yeah. year when we do uh, the facial anatomy. And so, um, and so, yeah, we do that all the time where we, there's some deep personalization happening and then we personalize and then, oh my God, we have to switch and be yeah, it's time to like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we keep going back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. And, and I think it, it's, it's just necessary, I think, for the profession. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we've had examples in the podcast where, um, and, and I'm maybe plug, you know, putting it in a plug for um, the podcast we had on the renal system about um, the, um, and, and I would like everyone to have a look at that where a patient de- you know discovered that they were their, their, their kidneys were failing and 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 it was like one day they were well and then then oh actually they've been feeling unwell but now this had to go they had to go uh, see to it in, in the hospital and things went really rapidly from like a normal day to like everything is up for grabs yeah and yeah. and so the, the the doctor in the or or in the room kind of just had to go into that mode of look i'm not i can't afford to be sentimental or to kind of hold your hands this is what you're gonna do or you're gonna die yeah <laughs> more or less yeah. Yeah. And, and and so and so yeah i i feel that so acutely and i and i and i completely i'm grateful to you for giving us the vocabulary or at least surfacing that it's a force to be able to say, yeah, this is actually what's happening. And it's happening more often than we admit. And it's, and it's have, I mean, and it's necessary uh, if we're going to be professionals, but also humans at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah. Oh, and I've just started trying to raise the bar on myself. Um, last fall, when we were in the lab, finally together again, after, you know, a year of not being in the lab for drawing, I've started working on, and of course it's a work in progress because it's a new lesson, but part of the lesson now for the class is that we're um, doing a lesson on skin and adipose tissue and clinical bias. So it's the amount of adipose the person has and also potentially the color of their skin. So we're looking at race and we're looking at fat mass And I also, I have a couple uh, live models who I work with who have a great sense of humor because they've worked with me for years. And sometimes I'll draw bony landmarks and muscles on them for my art students. So no one draws skin in my art classes, like everybody draws structures. But then I'll have them also be a part of my drawing class, you know, and um, so students will be looking at bodies with different fat mass of different age, different gender, different race. And it's a non-clinical situation. And they're spending all this time drawing. And what do you do when you're drawing? You have all this time to think about stuff. So, you know, I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to build this class. And, you know, another thing is when I'm teaching and I'm going into territory that is new for me, the first class is always the worst one, you know, the subsequent classes are better. So I always say to my students, you know, language is changing. Um, If I say anything that is offensive to any of you, you tell me right now and I will just change it. You know, it's like, I'll apologize in advance and I'll change the language. And that you know, makes my stumbling around and trying to figure out how to teach this stuff um, more tolerable for them, you know, and it also brings in, again, like different, the different issues that we're looking at when we're looking at anatomy, like text, you know, what the book and the models look like, and also the dissective cadavers, usually the fat mass has been trimmed away. And so every once in a while, we'll like, get to the cadavers before the dissection is complete and it's like yay look you guys look at all the look at all this fat underneath the skin like anybody want to draw that (laughs) you know so you can start to think about like adipose as an organ as a part of anatomy as a part of a person like how these components all work together and then also consider like what preconceptions you might have as well and i'm using terms like fat mass and adipose the um I've uh, taken some seminars uh, 
um, discussing like the language around fat and human bodies. And at these seminars, words like fat are preferred over overweight or other things that would like indicate the same kind of situation, but also kind of um, imply that there's a standard that somebody is over. So again, like, you know, with the language, things keep changing and like, hopefully anyone listening to this will also like give me some tolerance <laughs> as I go. Oh, I'm sure. And it's so interesting because we are, of course, living in a dynamic environment. And as Shagan yeah. mentioned earlier, when we say we're anatomists, it's like, oh, it, you know, nothing ever changes. We're like, oh, you have no idea. It's like, it's constantly changing. Not mm -hmm. only are we, you know, identifying new things or new functions, but the way we teach, the way we visualize, the way we talk changes. And you've just uh, really described that beautifully from your um, body of work. Um, thank you so my much body for, of work for sharing there. yep <laughs> for sharing all of that well thank you for letting me go on about this i really appreciate it i don't well, get to we, really talk this freely about like what i do that often oh it's beautiful Aww. um i know we're not supposed to have favorites but what's your favorite body part mm. oh this is do you want to hear like the really oh yeah bad we want to hear the real thing yeah okay I love the diaphragm muscle for Aww. its shape, for its function, right? Because, and the way I feel, you know, the way when you, when you inhale and it's depressing and it's like essentially squishing your guts outward, you know, the way you can use your abdominal musculature and your diaphragm to kind of direct, you know, people will say, send air to your hips and air to your whatever. It's not air, it's, you know, your intestines or whatever. But like when you become articulate with your diaphragm, I find that really fascinating. I love its flat tendinous surface. I love that it's also, you know, got apertures for the esophagus. And I just think that that's really kind of fascinating. And this is the thing I shouldn't say. I love skirt steak. Because you, because you can like see the fiber direction. Like when you get a piece of skirt steak, it's not a cross cut, you know, it's like you get the fibers like all organized. And so I get the skirt steak and then I just get into it. And I start explaining it to my husband over dinner. And <laughs> I do this a lot. Like when I have duck leg and like I can eat and the popliteus is still there. I get very excited, you know, and it's like, so popliteus and the diaphragm are my two like favorite muscles. I think that those, you know, and again, this is the a diaphragm. nerd's dream, Creota. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the diaphragm, because of, because of its shape, because of what it does, also because of the internal sensations it creates, it creates a number of like illusions that, you know, that we have to be able to like articulate with our own bodies in order to feel. I like have to say you like know, you loving amazing. the diaphragm is probably the encapsulation of your experience of the body and your history. Yes. I know breathing is so important for dancers, the way yes. they, they, how they communicate on stage. It's how, you know, they get in sync with each other. It's how they, you know, live in their bodies uh, as a massage therapist of course you're looking at the breathing and then yes. from an artist's point of view just appreciating the beauty of the diaphragm it's domed shape it's, yes yeah so there's very delicate structure and then it's critical importance so I think it makes total sense that the <laughs> diaphragm would be your favorite part of uh, the body thank you yeah I absolutely you know it's just it's so great I'm like I keep trying to come up with diaphragm projects. Oh, yeah. So I'm sure it will, it will one day, it will just come out of your pen. Yeah. The gauntlet has now been thrown. So now I have to look. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Creota, for joining us. It's been um, a, a delightful um, hour with you. And Aww. I've learned so much. And thank you for giving us insight into your. Uh, life and into your into your work. 
Oh, thank well, you thank so you much. so much for this conversation. It's really, it's just such a pleasure to be able to talk with people about my life and have them share similar experiences. So you guys know where I'm coming from, which is really great. Like, <laughs> and everyone listening to this too, I'm sure they're going to be, you know, they're going to also have been there or they'll be going there. So I'm, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to do this. It's just, you've made my week. I swear. Oh, thank you. <laughs> been a creator and uh, yeah. And um, well, that's it for today's uh, episode of body banter and um, uh, from myself and Claudia, see you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of body banter. We are Claudia and Shegun, and we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>